Nagel from George Washington University. So he will talk something about the correlation between peaks and the and that. I was surprised that we'll see in 20 minutes, 25 minutes, if any of you are also surprised by it. I'll be very interested in your, uh, your feedback. So um, I, I would like to uh, set this talk in context. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Thank you very much. So to put this talk in context, over the years I've given about a hundred some presentations on LENR to a few thousand people, and I can tell you right off the bat that this is the strangest of those presentations, okay? You may ask why. It's because I will give you questions but no answers, <laughs> okay? Now, you can judge at the end of the talk and in time whether or not this is a wild goose chase. Um, you, most of you probably know that uh, <laughs> phrase, but uh, for those of you who don't, a wild goose chase is an English saying that uh, used to describe a task that is likely to fail. Low probability of success. So I'm going to point out some things, and it may be a waste of time to consider them. On the other hand, it may be worthwhile. So it, I'll be very interested in the kind of feedback that I get from you. Okay, so this is an outline of the talk. One plus one is three. You all know that if you have this and you have this, the intersection of the two is the third thing. And the two things involved are transmutation data and screening data that appear to me to be correlated, which is why I was surprised by the uh, discovery that I uh, made. So um, we'll, we'll see what you think about it. Now, the question is, if, it, if they are correlated, why are they correlated? And we'll get more to that. Now, the situation is actually worse. It's one plus one plus one is six. Because there's a third thing involved, a theoretical optical model calculation done by Woodham and Larson. So I'm going to start out with that for two reasons. One is it's relevant. The other is there are well-defined peaks in that theoretical model that show up again and again during this talk. And then I'll go on to talk about the transportation data and the screening data. Okay, so this is a plot from um, Woodham and Larson. Uh, it says comparison. Let's see, some of the, oh yeah, you can see it, good. Uh, comparison with the Miley Patterson data. So horizontally you have atomic mass and vertically you have the reaction rate in, in Hertz of low energy neutrons with nuclei of various sizes across the periodic table. And the thing I would ask you to note is there are five peaks, one, two, three, four, five, and uh, they occur at specific values of atomic mass. Now, the data that's on here is going to be talked about later, so I won't pause to talk about it right now. But the, in red at the bottom, the peaks in the neutron cross-section correspond to, listen to the language, comfortably fitting the neutron wavelength within a spherical nuclear model into the potential wells that are formed by the nuclei. So what, what one can do is take those atomic masses, use the simple formula here that relates the cube root of the atomic mass to the radius of the nucleus and make a plot versus peaks one, two, three, four, and five. And then, taking the suggestion from the Widom Larson paper, say that the first one is due to fitting one wavelength, the second due to two, as indicated here, and so forth up the line. Okay, this doesn't prove anything, but that's a takeoff on their model. The slope gives the neutron wavelength in nuclear matter, which is 2.154. Uh, femtometers according to this plot. 
And if any of you know that wavelength independently, I would love to talk to you. I've tried very hard to find that in the literature, and it failed so far. But in any event, that's what comes out of this. OK, so um, that's the background on the optical model, one out of the, uh, the three things. Turning now to the transmutation data, we have uh, cartoons of two experiments, one done in the middle of the US, the other done in the north of uh, Japan. Very, very, very different electrochemical LENR experiments. On the left, the Miley Patterson thing was a, a collection of a small plastic beads covered with metal in a flow system. On the right, uh, Mizuno and his colleagues had a sealed system. You can see one was run for about a half a month, the other for about a month. They used multiple analytical techniques, sometimes before but always after the experiment to diagnose the materials in the experiment. And as you see, three out of the four techniques were in common. So th these were massive experiments, uh, multiple runs done over a long period of time, both reported in 1996, curiously, OK? So this is a uh, plot, atomic mass horizontally, and production rate, numbers of atoms per cc per second from, my, from um, Miley's data, run one, run two, or the number seven, whatever, plus a similar run, same system, same beat, same flow system, done in Texas by a company called EarthTech. And then they overplotted their data with the, um, the heavier circles with the uh, data from uh, Illinois. And the thing I would uh, ask you to look at and internalize is there are one, two, three, four, five vertical lines on this that line up with the peaks in the optical model calculation. And they'll come up again and again in the talk. So if you look at this, you say, hmm, on the right, there seems to be some kind of alignment. In the middle, maybe, and the left, it gets a little fuzzy. OK, but there, there's a suggestion that there was a validation of the Miley experiment by the EarthTech experiment. These, these plots, while they're very scattered, are, are similar. OK, but, but, but what about comparing the Miley experiment with the Mizuno experiment. OK, so these are plots, Miley and Patterson on the top. It's essentially the same kind of data that I just showed you. Atomic mass number across the bottom, production rate, atoms per cc per second at the top. And they made, made quantitative measurements before and after, subtracted the concentrations, and plotted these. And you, you, you see the indication that here are the same dashed lines that you'll see again and again, and, and it looks like they sort of line up. So then you, you, you go to the uh, Mizuno data. It's the uh, counts from a secondary ion mass spectrometer done after the experiment. And, and yeah, it looks to be kind of a lineup again here. Now, I've forgotten which one of those was reported first, but I remember vividly saying to myself when I saw the second plot, heard the second paper, that's just like the first one. I mean, it, it really struck me because there have been relatively few comparisons, head-to-head -head comparisons, in the field of LENR over the years. And this was a head-to-head -head comparison. It, it, uh, I, I say I remember the feeling very, very vividly. So um, Schultman in um, Switzerland that I did a, uh, an analysis of these experiments and uh, mathematical correlation. The bottom line is in red here. Our analysis revealed that the data sets exhibit a similar pattern and correlate with a computed, uh, with a computed function and uh, would have large uh, peaks. In other words, we did not rely solely on the appearance of the peaks. We did a mathematical calculation, and it, it pointed to it. Now, if all that wasn't enough, let's turn to a plot made by uh, Ed Storms. He, is one of the uh, best students of the LNR literature, reads paper, he plots, he says this paper reported copper, this paper reported platinum, and he, he makes this plot of the number of papers versus atomic number now. So we just switched from monitoring atomic mass to atomic number, the conversion is in the little boxes on the top. And you look at it, you say the same lines, the same lines, they pretty well line up on the right, in the middle, uh, you know, th th there's a, an indication here from a uh, student of the literature, Ed Storms, that um, we have this, uh, this correlation again. OK, so now I will summarize the transmutation part. LENR can occur across the periodic, periodic table, not just the light elements. 
The Miley and Earthtech experiments were similar. The Miley and Mizuno experiments were similar. The three data sets were found to be statistically correlated by uh, good analyses, uh, Schultz's analyses. The uh, peaks occur where there are multiples of the wavelengths of neutrons in nuclear matter. Okay, some people, some peaks also show up in a storm stop collision. Now, the, 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 this is all good news. This is interesting. It's exciting even. The trouble is we don't understand why those peaks occur in the transmutation data. And there are students of transmutation data, like John Paul here, who've looked at this, and if he knows how to explain why those peaks occur, is it in the starting distribution of elements? Uh, is it in the reaction rates as a function of atomic mass? Is it in atomic? We don't know, basically. Okay, so that's why I'm doing you the disservice of giving you a problem without a solution. Okay, now I, I put here for reasons of uh, scholarship, if you will, <laughs> Concerns about the transmutation data. I'm not going to speak to this. Uh, it's being recorded by video now. If somebody wants to look at it, they can stop the, uh, the, the uh, playback of the video and look at it. Let me go on to the um, screening data, something very close to the um, organizers of this conference. So this is the diagram you all know. Deuteron, Deuteron, you have the um, hot and cold fusion branching ratios, very, very different. And, um, we um, know whether it's high energy or low energy, you can detect what's happening by looking at the uh, measured energetic particles that come out of the reactions. So what, what is screening? Well, if you have a, um, let's see, I, I can use this, okay. So here, here's an incoming projectile, a deuteron, and it's uh, going at a deuteron that is surrounded by electrons, screening electrons. It doesn't see the field of that deuteron because of the screening until it starts to penetrate the cloud and then it feels the full electrostatic potential by the time it gets into contact. Another um, way to look at it is a nice diagram from our chairman, uh, Kasagi-san here, that has the particle coming in. And um, if it's a bare uh, target, then you have the Coulomb barrier indicated by the solid line, but the screening reduces that, and therefore reduces the, uh, the uh, distance over which tunneling has to occur for sub-Coulomb collisions before you get to the Yukawa potential. And uh, this, this red um, diagram here indicates alpha decay, which is what Gamma used uh, to develop this concept uh, early in the uh, field of the nuclear physics. On the right is a uh, photograph of this incredible setup that Conrad and his colleagues have that I hope to visit it and um, you know, see it. So um, we'll move on. You'll see plots of data Horizontally is kilo electron volts of the incoming particles. And then vertically is the thick target yield on the top. Uh, you see palladium one run, two runs uh, indicated here. Uh, palladium, uh, palladium oxide is both palladium, iron, gold, and so forth. And there are two uh, plots in each one of these. There's the uh, dashed line, which is the extrapolation of the cross section at high, you know, above the Coulomb barrier energy comes in, no screening, and um, it, so it's the observed values divided by that value, that's the enhancement factor shown at the bottom here, which, which, which becomes very, very large, very, very fast, it's exponential, and by fitting it, one gets a screening potential, a screening energy, 600 dB in the case of the palladium oxide, the values are, are indicated here. Okay, so the screening potential, screening energies, are a measure of the effectiveness of screening in sub low energy uh, nuclear collisions. So, so let's compare this screening data. On the right are two plots. The top one you see is from uh, Chersky and Buka early on. You have atomic number across the bottom, screening energies derived from fitting experiments here. Uh, and Kasaki published a similar uh, diagram. They're similar because they use the same uh, set of data to make up the plots. So I was looking at this and I said to myself, looks like there are peaks there. I wonder how they line up with the peaks in the transmutation data. So I put these dashed lines from the transmutation data on them and damn, they line up. How is it that these two incredibly exper different experiments, what chemical electrolysis and high vacuum beam experiments can show the same peaking. Okay, that's the question. That's why I was surprised 
Any else, anybody else surprise you? <laughs> this is interesting. Now you can also make a comparison of the experimental data as a function of atomic number with calculated potential energies, uh, screening energies, and uh, th there's a, um, a large difference, a roughly factor of two difference. It's well known, it's discussed in several uh, papers. There are few instances where they have been uh, 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 resolved where you get similar values uh, cal computationally and theoretically, not shown here. But notice, no peaking, okay, curiously. So to summarize the screening data, Many sophisticated, careful, low beam energy experiments have been done to produce screening energies. Rawls group, Tversky's group, Kasagi's group, the folks in Slovenia now, the folks in Russia, that there's a lot of interest in this. It's, it's really, really important nuclear physics, okay? Dozens of screening values have been measured. The data is scattered, but the peaks seem apparent. The screening energies appear to peak at the same values of atomic number and mass as the transmutation data. And the apparent correlation implicates that neutrons are, uh, neutrons are involved because of that fitting business that I showed you early on. Okay, the good news is that, the bad news is the peaking, if real, is not understood. Okay, now if anybody knows the answer, I really want to talk to you because I'm taking your time bringing up an issue which I can't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, so. I have here another set of concerns. I will, read, I will address one of them. The, the screening energies that have been obtained uh, have been shown to be sensitive to various things, surface contamination, structural and chemical defects, locations of the target nuclei, uneven deuteron distributions, motion of the deuterons. Uh, you know, this is a challenging field. And uh, why do you think it is that you have at the university here an ultra-high vacuum system? <laughs> it's because of these problems. So I'm not going to uh, spend any more time on this. I, I'm nearly done. A speculation on the role of, neut uh, of uh, neutrons. So here's a target nucleus on the um, right, and a deuteron comes in, and it's going to get oriented so that the neutron goes first because the proton is being pushed away by the field of the positive nucleus, the target nucleus. So you're going to get this orientation. So the, 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 the neutron is the, the first one into the nucleus. Now, many of you uh, must know about so-called D, D, uh, I, I misspoke, deuteron stripping reactions, where you send a deuteron in and the neutron sticks because of the strong force and the proton goes on. Five minutes, thank you, sir. It's a very well-established field. I, I wrote an academic paper in 1966 on deuteron stripping. It, it happens. And I'm of the opinion that if we went back and looked at the theories of deuteron stripping, which are rather well-developed, we may find some kind of hint at a solution to the problem that I'm raising here. Okay, so to finish up, apparent peaks in transmutation and screening experiments require further study to determine A, the reality, and B, their utility, and the effort to validate and understand the peaking might be a wild goose chase. However, it might end well. It might end with additional understanding of the mechanisms that cause LENR. Thank you very much. Thank you many questions, and we have uh, five minutes to discuss. I have no answer to your question, but in the late 90s, I've done a similar experiment with beads for six months. One cell was with light water, and the other one was heavy water. I have the data, I have the ICPMS data of the whole spectrum. So if you want to pay, spend time to analyze it, I can give you the data, oh, yeah. raw data. The biotransportation data, that's so what you the said. They're the same size, uh, the, the, the cells with, be with beads. 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 Be beads. Be beads. Like this, the, the one you saw. Yeah, so. so yeah, uh, I can show you, the, I can give you the data. Of course I'll analyze it. <laughs> yes. Conrad. Okay, so uh, I have some explanations for experiments you have measured, um, you have shown here. So, for the first, if you are looking for optical model, uh, you have, of course, this uh, nice uh, resonance like structures. And this is because of. Uh, magic numbers of uh, closed nuclear shells. This known effect, it is so-called S-wave resonances, 
and this uh, because of uh, you know strong binding of the nucleons there, and they are connected to the so-called S process, uh, astrophysical process uh, yeah. um, producing heavy elements. So this uh, just this structure you have, and then uh, if you uh, want to compare uh, transportation, you you you've said already, you know. That is uh, very nice correlated to the um, abundances uh, in the universe of different elements. So this is just what you have presented. Uh, yeah. and therefore, and therefore, what is important to look at maybe uh, the data the people measured in transportation with the diffusion coefficient of some uh, elements and other elements, and then you, maybe you can see some enhancement of, of, of the fusion. Yeah, I, I appreciate your comments. I will note in passing that um, I, I gave a talk at ICCF 17, and uh, Kidwell from NRL said that the peaking in the transmutation data is due to dirt. You know, it's the distribution of elements in the earth of the in the crust of the earth. And Schultman and I went back and did a correlate, attempted a correlation between the distribution of elements in the crust of the earth and the transmutation data, and it really didn't work out well. We have a paper on that. That's not to argue with what you're saying. It's it's essentially to agree that um, we uh, have an additional need and opportunity to do further studies in order to really understand why these peaks occur and how they relate to each other. I think this is well, well understood. Another point, if you are looking for screening, you know, there is uh, also some contribution, uh, contribution from the uh, conduction electrons, from bound electrons, and from the lattice. And you have uh, some peaks, of course, uh, which are connected to the uh, to the shell structure in atoms. Of course, you see some 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 peaks as well, and they are uh, very similar. But what is important to look at, you know, the the uh, detail of very very exact position of the maxima because it's changing. There is not roughly it seems to be <coughs> very similar, but it's not not the same. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, no argument. I went back and I looked at the atomic number dependence of ionization energies and other atomic, you know, mm -hmm. parameters, and um, I, I didn't find the same number of peaks in the same places. Okay, yeah, some of them different. overlap, not, but not all of them. So um, I, I have no argument with what you're saying. I absolutely agree that uh, we, we should look at these things and try and figure out mm -hmm. what's the reason for all this. Yeah, there's a close shell model in atoms, you know, there is something... Yeah, yeah, I, I, I hear it. So thanks, Bob. Uh, so David, uh, actually my point is related to closed shells and, and, and binding energies, but I sent you um, a, a Russian graph about the atomic volumes when I reviewed the first version of this paper, and said it appeared that they were similar in, in that, and if, if the process requires um, something to occur with the level of um, predictability, and it's trying to occur in a small space. The smaller the, the starting item, the, the more likely it is to be a target. Sorry, uh, the denser it is if yeah. you're having something interacting with it. And so you see these five peaks in the at atomic volumes, and it, it, the products are what you're observing, which is the offset from that. Yeah, so um, my... Uh Inclination is to say that might explain the screening data, but how does it explain the transportation data? It, because it's an offset from that. <clears throat> okay. We'll you talk more that. on it. I I, uh, uh, I I remember what you said to me, but I I I didn't recognize what you're saying. So okay. I'll, I'll okay. look forward to talking. Right. Please, so, make, uh, please make a question short. Yeah. Very please. short. Very short. Uh, how you identify peaks correlates to look at magic numbers? Are they correlate well? Because I just by visual inspection it seems to be very close. Um, so the peaks are identified from the peaks in the um, uh, Widom Larsen optical model. Okay, and uh, I don't think I went back and compared them with the magic numbers. So of course I will do that. Do we? Yeah. Just a quick uh, comment. Uh, what is the difference between different uh, chemical elements uh, which decrease the atomic number? Simply, it uh, gives uh, some other, uh, let's say, forms of the inner electron orbitals. And uh, my opinion is we have to search for certain correlation 
in, cons in consideration with inner electron orbitals. And all of them, they're connected with local functions. So, sorry, go. Yeah, so, so um, again, let's separate the transportation data from the uh, screen What's, data. Yeah. Yeah, it, mine is just a suggestion, uh, if you're not aware, uh, someone has already tried to look at uh, transmutation data of other experiments. Uh, I don't know if you're aware uh, of cavitation experiments uh, in Mercury that gave uh, many, many uh, transmutation results. And uh, uh, there is uh, at least one I found, but I think they made another one that I cannot find, uh, Albertini and Capotosto, who uh, tried to do a kind of Mendeleev table with other parameters, and they found that the transmutation were on the diagonals of these. Uh, uh, so uh, this is called uh, toward nuclear metabarysis. Yeah, I very much appreciate those references. Uh, thank you for that. So, uh, in, in passing, you see the uh, acknowledgement on the bottom here. Both of the images of the geese were made up using the AI program made for me by our daughter, Ann Elberts. <laughs>